something specifically part number spitter number 34. And along the way, we're going to we're going to um, <coughs> explain for the fifth time, as I said, uh, spinner assignments 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, without necessarily going through all the details, because that will take us the entire period. So let's go back to the very beginning. One has a random number table in the back of our book and probably every other textbook and other, other places as well, which is supposed to have an average, because the numbers run between 0 and 9, it's supposed to have an, av an ideal average of 4.5, as we've established many, many times already. The only question is, does a, does a particular random number table truly have that average of 4.5? And the solution, the ideal solution, is to actually take every single member of the population, add them all up and divide by, let's say there were 10,000 of them, divide by 10,000, if it comes out to 4.500, then the answer is yes, it's 4.5. But most of the time, for practical reasons, you can't access the whole population. Like if you're doing something about the whole United States or the whole New York City or the whole even St. John's, there's 20,000 people. And here also, there are too many numbers to deal with. So you take a sample. The whole point of purpose of statistics is to develop methods that you can take a shortcut and still get the right answer most of the time. You can't get the right answer 100% of the time because you are taking a shortcut. But you can get the right answer. So instead of doing nothing, because it's impossible to sample the whole world, but it is possible. So we're taking a small sample. I admit it's small, but gets a go gets the numbers going. You take the five numbers, let's say a th you know, three, zero, seven, six, four, to pick a, a random example. And of course, the way you're going to process those numbers is by taking a simple average. And the common sense approach would be if the average is close to 4.5, we're going to say, I believe the A is zero. And can I give you a pillow? No. And if it's far from 4.5, I'm going to say, that, that, that means the age is not 4.5. So the question we've been working on is how close does it have to be? So before we go into you know, do, discussing that further, we can put down a little more formally that the age zero in this case is the average truly is equal to 4.5. The H one called the alternative hypothesis that it's not equal to 4.5. Let's remember that the age zero is the, is the status quo. We give the benefit of the doubt to the age zero. So if the average comes out to 4.6, we're still going to say we believe the A0 because it's pretty close to 4.5. If it comes out to 4.4, we're going to say it's the A0. If it comes out to 4.7, we're going to say probably the A0. If it comes out to 8.8, .8, that already is pretty far from, from 4.5. We'll probably say the H1, just repeating what we said, of course, before. So the only question is how close does it have to be? Um, is that one? Okay. So we developed the theory of the, t we really went through the whole theory already, but we haven't actually changed the theory into a practical pr process yet. That's what we're going to do today. We basically said, let's, let's basically figure out how, let's make a boundary. And then we picked the boundary, I think, 3.5 and 5.5 as just, a, just an initial lucky, you know, so guess. That if you're in the boundary, you're going to accept a zero. If you're higher than 5.5, we're going to say that's the boundary that we consider far from 4.5. We're going to say reject a zero. And if you're lower than 3.5, we're going to say reject A0. And the only question we're left with is that particular choice of boundary. Notice that it's symmetric. It's an equal amount above 4.5 and below 4.5. Is that boundary a good, reasonable guess? And we're going to analyze it by a very pragmatic approach that if you get the right answer most of the time by using this boundary, then it's a good boundary. If you get the wrong answer a lot of the high percentage of the time, then it's a bad boundary. So we're going to analyze that by analyzing how often what's called a type one error occurs. What's a type one error? If you pick a boundary and you, because of that boundary, you made the mistake and because of random numbers and the luck that happened to you when you apply it, that you decided to reject the A0 when in fact, the vertical line means supposing or assuming or when in fact, the A0 is true, that means you made a mistake. Now how would that happen in that particular case? If the X bar is bigger than 5.5, if the X bar is lower than 3.5. If that happened, then you're going to wind up rejecting a zero. So the question of what's the probability of making a type one error? Because we really know the fact that it's going to happen on occasion, we know it's going to happen. You can't get around it. The question is if it happens a lot, then it's bad. If it happens a small percentage of the time, then we can live with that because we recognize we can't be perfect here. That probability is called alpha. And the only question is how do you calculate that alpha? Well, the answer is that's exactly what we learned how to do in chapter seven. We basically made three pictures. First, you make the first picture representing the population under 
the A0. If the A0 is true, in other words, you give the benefit of doubt. So let's make believe we do have a perfectly good random number table where the numbers run between 0 and 9 and an average of 4.5. And of course, we also know as a byproduct that the sigma is 2.87. Well, if you take a sample of five numbers from this population, we know from chapter seven that we can expect that the x-bars resulting from that, if you did it you know, time after time after time, the x-bars will have a middle value, will be a bell-shaped curve by the central limit theorem. We'll have a middle value called the mu of the x-bars exactly the same as the hypothesized value of the original population, because the numbers are coming from that population. And, the, uh, and the, sp the amount of spread, or how close the averages are to the ideal answer, they're not going to be exactly 4.5, 4.5, 4.5 every time you do it. They're going to spread out, and that amount of spread is equal to the standard error of the mean. And it's, it can be predicted by the sigma over the square root of n, which is 287 in our case, divided by the square root of 5, which is 1.28, which is 1.28. And from that point, we can now place the boundary that we just came as a lucky guess to start with. 5.5 is around here. 3.5 is around here. So the accept region will be here, and the reject region will be here. And the probability of getting into the reject region when, in fact, the average is truly 4.5, that probability, which is physically the size of these areas, so it's called the size of the rejection region, that's the alpha. So if you actually do the calculation as we learned about in chapter six and more specifically in chapter seven of going to the Z table, which has this basic shape, and converting the 5.5 to a corresponding Z, which is done by the formula X bar minus mu of X bar over sigma of X bar. In this case, it's 3.5 minus 4.5 over 1.28. And we said last time that came out to 0.73, because we did this like four times already. Anybody, I should know the number by heart. That come out to one over the 1.28 is 0.74, something like that. Can somebody please take out a calculator and just do it. The one divided by 1.28 is how much? Thank you. Point what? 70? 78? All right, 78. So this is 78, which is roughly around here. So the the rejection region, when translated into z-scores, is simply anything bigger than 78. And of course, if you plug in 5.5 uh, into this, I'm sorry, this comes out to minus 78. If you plug in 5.5, it comes out to positive 78. So the rejection regions are plus or minus 0.78. And the acceptance region is if you end up uh, is between here and here. So if you really want to use the boundary of 3.5 to 5.5, that means you're using a z-score boundary of 78 to minus 7. So the question is, how often would you make a type 1 error? And the answer is the chance of getting below this. And then we did it last time. We'll do it again. What is that area? How much is the area? If you look up minus 78 in the back of the z-table, what do you see there? Again, just simply reading your notes. We did this already in class several times. Yes, 2177. And of course, the area to the right of 70 is also 2177. So the alpha is 2177 plus 2177, which is equal to about 40, what is it, 14, 15, 30, 40, almost 44%. 44%. And 44% you should interpret as a bad result, because if you're making a mistake called a type 1 error 44% of the time, you should not be happy with that. So the question is, what do you do about that? Well, one way is you increase the sample size, but we're not going to take that approach, even though it's perfectly valid, because we're making this a stat 1, we're making it simple. The only other approach is to change the boundary. And that was spinner assignment number 30. So 30 well, spinner assignment number 30 was to choose the boundary. 31 was to give a reason why you chose the boundary, and the answer should be something like, most of your averages from the pr previous parts of the spitter assignment, where you picked examples of five numbers and got averages from a perfectly good table, because our table is a perfectly good table, gave you numbers between whatever you pick as your, as your boundaries. But 32 says calculate the alpha. Well, if you pick 3.5 and 5.5, which I told you, by the way, you, when you hand in your spinner assignment, whenever you hand this in, to really do the last day of class, um, this part of it, because it's the last part of the material, when you hand it in, you can't use 3.5 and 5.5, because that's what we're doing in class. But whatever pair of numbers you chose, um, you calculate this and you get your alpha. But then after you get an alpha and 44% you shouldn't be happy with, the question is, 
I want to make it smaller. The question is how much smaller? And I asked the class to do it at 5%. That's a traditional number. We talked a little bit about why, even though there's no great reason why. 